Hello, Falcon families. I'm Adriana Northcutt, the assistant principal at Thunder Mountain High School. I'm here in partnership with NAMI and Juno Suicide Prevention Coalition. This is the second, or I'm sorry, a third of a six part series about how to improve communication and therefore wellness at home. I thank you for joining me today, Erin and Tina. Would you mind introducing yourselves and your role with NAMI and the goal of uh, NAMI and the Juno Suicide Prevention Coalition? Tina, would you mind starting us off? Sure, thank you, Adriana, for having us. Um, uh, before we get started, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Aquan and the Takuquan, and um, I just uh, appreciate their stewardship of, of the land and their culture, and, and just always good to recognize where we are. Uh, my name is Tina Deasis Wright. I am Ducktainton from Huna. Uh, those are my ancestral grounds, and I um, work for the Juno Suicide Prevention Coalition as a program coordinator. Um, our goal in being here today is to uh, just to improve communication at home, as you had mentioned, and um, having that, that better communication is going to create uh, better health throughout the family for each individual in the family. So thank you, Adriana. My name is Aaron, and I'm the director of NAMI Juno and the Suicide Prevention Coalition. And yeah, like Tina said, we want to promote good mental health. And this is one of many ways that we can promote good mental health in the world. So happy to talk more about uh, good communication at home. Great. Thank you. All right. So I'm really excited to have you guys here again. And I appreciate that we are doing this partnership and we're doing quite a few um, different series. So that's really great. Um, so within our organization, what we're kind of focusing on is how to build positive relationships, and that's the focus of our series. Tina, can you briefly describe the goal of our discussions, and Erin, can you discuss why this is critical for family health? Sure. So the, our goal um, is to go through a series and, and talk about um, just the simple practices, maybe even um, checklists or just awareness, things that we might might naturally do as far as building our communication skills. Other things perhaps that we haven't thought about or maybe we thought about them at one time and uh, now with all of the challenges uh, with COVID especially and, and whatever all that brings, um, just how to get centered on that so that we are being intentional in our practices and um, in our relationship building, which is which is always changing, right? So there's there's, Never a dull moment. Yeah, never a dull moment is exactly right. Like emotions inevitably happen. We get happy, we get sad, we get angry, frustrated, scared, all the emotions that exist. And good communication makes all the difference in making sure that those emotions are expressed in a positive way and that they're talked about um, in a way that makes it an overall good experience. Tina and I have an argument and we ultimately say like, oh, I understand where you're coming from and we walk away. That's a much different experience than have an argument and leave it in an argument and walk away and separate at that point. Like, even, like the emotions are gonna happen, but you can make it an overall positive experience if you have good communication and come to some kind of understanding. Right, thank you. So how to build relationships, even in a pandemic. So as um, I said, this is part three of our series. And in part two of our series, we discussed how to draw on collective identity. In today's presentation, we will discuss how to anticipate our needs. Tina, can you talk a, talk a little bit about um, this slide and how it guides our upcoming discussion? Sure. So um, as you can see, there's, there's six uh, little graphics there and uh, one and two checking in and reaching out uh, was one of the steps that we took in building our communication and then drawing on our collective identity. So again, these are, there's six different parts today, anticipating our needs um, and setting boundaries. And, and we might go through in a, a linear direction, but again, life is, life is messy. That's not really how it goes. Uh, sometimes we're only capable of doing one part at a time. And other times we need to draw in on all six of these different pieces and, and many others that we haven't mentioned. Uh, but this graphic is just a tool to remember some of the parts 
Um, but I just, I can't say enough that, um, that it's, it's not meant to be linear and asking for help, which is huge, could go with any one of these, right? So it's, uh, it's important to remember. So as you, you review uh, these or as you're listening or you're taking notes, have some terrific grace with yourself and understanding that how you handle a situation once may not be how you'll handle it the next time and that these are all components at our disposal. Great, thank you very much. All right, so jumping in here, Erin, can you describe to us what it means to anticipate our needs and provide some examples of what this could look like for a family? Yeah, so anticipating need, needs, there's, we break it down into four different categories here. There's a lot of different ways to think about it. I think one is um, stuff that you as an adult have experienced that your kid hasn't yet that you want to share how that thing works. So that's like life skills, getting a driver's license, opening a bank account, okay, going to the store for the first time. First time you take a four-year-old to the store and hold them up and they hand the cashier a dollar for whatever they're buying, like you're showing them how to do life skills. You anticipated that they're probably gonna to need to buy something at a store at some point in their lives and you're showing them how to do it. Um, there's also physical needs. Like young people need private space. As you become a teenager, you probably need a little bit more private space than a six-year-old and you know, things like transportation whether it's to getting to school, getting to a practice, getting to a friend's house. Um, we know that transportation is needed in some facets of life in some fashion or another. And then the one that obviously as mental health people we're gonna talk about the most is emotional needs. And anticipating what kind of emotions your child will have and helping them out when those emotions happen. So like before a tryout, talk to them about Hey, you're trying out for the baseball team. What are you going to feel like if you win? Happy. Great. How do you want to celebrate if you, if you make the team? Ice cream. And maybe you make sure Donna's is open late enough after the tryouts if you're going to celebrate. And asking, what's going to, how are you going to feel if you don't make the team? Sad. What do you want to do when you feel sad? Maybe it's ice cream again. Maybe it's the same solution for both. Or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's listen to a certain song. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's play a certain video game. So the point is just talking this stuff through and it's not going to be a perfect conversation. Um, you're never going to like really come to like a real concrete, yes, this is the solution plan, but talking things through beforehand helps your kids think about how to respond in a given situation. Um, another example is relationships. So during a kid's first relationship, talking about how they might feel if they break up with that person or they get in a fight with that person just to get the gears turning um, and planting some kind of seeds in them. So if, you're going, you, if you break up with your significant other, you're going to be sad. How do you wanna deal with it when you're sad? What, can, what do you want us, your parents to do when you're sad? And they're not gonna give a perfect answer. They don't really know. They've never had that feeling before, but at least start thinking about it. And that way, when that does happen and it will inevitably happen, um, like the seed is planted and it makes it easier to have the conversation in the moment hey, you broke up, we talked about this before, you thought maybe you'd want some alone time, is that still the case? Or would you rather us go on a walk together? What would be helpful now? And just makes the conversation easier when that inevitable emotional event happens. And then a fourth category that I think is particularly relevant right now because a lot of things are closed down and kids are only going to school part-time is things that affect the entire community. Like we're going to resume going in person to school full time at some point here, maybe it'll be in the fall. Um, and just talking about those, those things um, beforehand as well. Like, hey, in August, maybe like August 1st, if school starts August 17th, you're gonna be back to school full time now. That's gonna be weird after last year. What do you think it's gonna be like? How do you think it's gonna be better? How do you think it's gonna be worse? And again, there's no like perfect script. There's no right script, there's no correct or incorrect answer from your kid, but just kind of talking the stuff through so that they can anticipate what's going to happen uh, beforehand and lending your experience um, in the situations where you have experience. Yeah, I tried out for a team one time and this is what happened and maybe it'll be the same for you and maybe it'll be different for you. Sharing your tidbits, but also just trying to plant seeds and get, get your kids gears turning about what will happen in their lives in the future. I think this is particularly helpful um, for children that might have anxiety, um, might have ADD, have a history of trauma, 
um, being able to anticipate events makes them much, makes it easier for those individuals to manage their anxiety or their PTSD in the moment. So it's helpful stuff for everybody, but in particular for kids who have those diagnoses. Great. Yeah, thank you. I, and I think it's really, I, I really like that you have the four categories because I think oftentimes these overlap, right? Like our physical needs and our emotional needs are, are closely related. Um, but I think when we're able to anticipate those things, then it allows those conversations to happen a lot more naturally and more honestly. So I, I like that we can break it down in categories, but understanding like they are, they're all kind of blending together in some capacity oftentimes. Sometimes they are very independent, but usually not. So yeah, I, I like being able to think of it in that way. So great example. The other, the other thing that I wanna say, Erin, that I like about um, going through the anticipation of the needs and as you're explaining it, is on all of these, there is that expression of, uh, of care, right? There's that expression of care. And, and as you mentioned, Adriana, kind of building those pathways for communicating, being able to talk uh, about whatever comes up. And it's not right or wrong, it's talking, it's being honest, it's being vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that. And, and I will say too, that also the anticipation of needs uh, as we will see later in mine, is when there is this time uh, crunch by anticipating some of our needs also helps to keep down some of the conflict. You know, so it's both. I, I mean, I, I just think it's so critical in, in showing how we care as well as managing conflict, which is another section in this, but anticipating needs also will help to manage that. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. All right, so kind of moving on kind of into that next phase. Um, so anticipating needs can go really well, but it can, but it, we can't always anticipate all the things that are coming our way. So, you know, as a parent, as an educator, I find it really helpful to kind of think of some action steps that allow me to build positive relationships. Um, and it, it's helpful to kind of, for me to kind of have a, a process that I go through. Um, and I think a lot of families are, are trying to do that and they're just maybe not sure where to start in that process. So Tina, you mentioned you have, you have children. So can you give us some examples of where this process was really successful or maybe where you found that it wasn't as successful? Absolutely. And Adriana, I, I hope they never watch us because they'll be like, I'm telling all the family secrets, right? <laughs> uh, so so I, I think the biggest thing that we can do as parents is remembering our own experiences. Um, when we were young, right? Our, our life experiences says that uh, we um, might be better able to anticipate the needs of our youth, right? And putting ourselves in their shoes. Um, so I say that, but then I also caution that we as parents are not going to go through all of the same experiences as our children do. And that's okay. So be, you know, there's that surprise and, and where we may get stuck and it's like, I don't even know how to deal with this, right? And it can be scary. It can be really scary. Um, so we have here a couple of different examples and um, there are so many to choose from and it's just kind of thinking it through, you know, and hence anticipating the needs. Uh, one of the things that, that, and this one was born out of conflict, is that we were always, my kids were late for school. Um, so anticipating some of the things that we needed to do and taking some proactive steps was laying out school clothes the night before. This was for my daughter, especially. My, I don't think my son ever cared what he looked like, but my daughter did. And she looked great, even if she was two hours late. <laughs> right. Um, so having our clothes laid out the night before was something that was really helpful for her. Uh, with my son, he would do the homework, but he wouldn't turn it in. Right. And that's like, to me, paying for the ice cream and not eating it. Um, you know, but it, words, it didn't help. The words didn't help. He'd get busy. He's chumming with his buddies and, and, and it just, it didn't get in the, in the backpack. So we had to do little things like put them in the backpack before you go so it's not at home right and then 
And then uh, how will you remember once you're at school? How will you remember, you know, getting it there didn't mean it was going to be turned in, but walking through those processes and asking him, how will you remember? I'm not there, son. I can't remember for you. How will you remember? And, you know, it changed, I think, a couple different years and until and he just finally is stuck with him that I have to remember. Um, but setting it up, you know, and again, that's responding in, in um, meeting kids where they're at, whatever the need is, and meeting our, our, our kids where they're at. Um, another example is when kids don't perform the way that they think they should. Um, I, one particular story that, that comes into mind for me, and this is the emotional needs, and, and thank you, Aaron, for putting that out, um, is recognizing their disappointment. And, um, and then looking at, uh, in this particular case, uh, do, we, do we want to try again? This is your choice, right? It's your dream, it's your deal. Do we want to try again? Shall we create a new plan? And again, there's so many scenarios that we can put in here. Um, but uh, my son was in, in uh, judo when he was younger and um, he later went on to do um, upper level martial arts and many different kinds. But when he was younger, he was on a relatively young team and they were competing in a state championship. And he was watching the older groups compete first, which in my mind is a mistake. We should have had the younger ones compete first. But we walked in and he heard those bodies slamming really hard on the mats and it scared him. Uh, so he's at his first tournament and he just couldn't bring himself to compete. So he didn't, you know, and he's, um, uh, he's feeling bad because he's letting down his, because uh, he's scared, right? And, and he didn't feel like he should be that way, I don't think. And uh, he had his team members and his coach all come, you know, trying to get him to come on. And, and uh, his father, bless him, made it okay for him to come up on the bleachers and just sit this one out. And, and so he just watched. He'd never been here before. He just had to sit it out and watch a process. Um, his father tried to encourage him, but gave him and said, yeah, it, it is scary. I, you know, acknowledged how he was feeling um said that we can go back we can practice more we can try again uh remember you know how to fall when you're hitting that mat it, it's it makes a bigger noise than it actually feels or you know if son if this is not your deal and you want a different sport we can do that too uh so i was watching them behind and, and really in awe of how my husband handled that um because he really just let him be it, it's okay uh, so that was great. And then they ate candy and watched the rest of the tournament. Um, so another one of anticipating needs in, in my kids, and this is as they were older, uh, was after high school, what were some of their plans? You know, we had talk that, well, you can go right to work if you want, but then you have to pay rent. If you want to go to school, well, then of course you can live here rent free, right? That is your work, you're going to school. And there was, there was always an underlying expectation that they should go to college. Um, so we supported their dreaming, right? If, if they wanted to be, well, and now with my granddaughter, of course she has an interest in space. So now we all think that she's gonna be an astronaut, but when she was two, she wanted to be a cat. So, you know, it changes with kids and that's okay, but support the dreaming, whatever it is. Um, and talk early about it. And what does that look like? And, and noticing, pointing out what people, different things that people do. Um, and I think it's really important to, to do the exploration. Um, and then we got to the point, and this is where, when I say, if you don't have that experience, um, it will be hard for you to know how to anticipate what's needed. Uh, my husband and I didn't go to college. I didn't go to school until to college until my kids were in college. Um, so I was really late. We did all of our planning and what have you, but I was really late in knowing how to support the planning phase of it. I had to find resources as a first generation college student. Well, I say I'm second because my kids went first. Um, finding the resources 
And if they teach me how to get on the computer, then I could do some of the research or they could help me. And um, asking them what they're doing in school, some of their classes are going to talk about uh, how do you go through college or, or um, meeting with some of their counselors. And I was trying to stay a, a step ahead of them. Um, and that's okay. Or I would bring them with me and say, how do we figure this out and do it together? Uh, and the reason I point this out is, is that some things we can't be prepared for. We, we don't know. That's not what was in our life experience. Um, and so you, you have to be okay with that. And you have to know that you can figure it out together and have that inquiry, right? And we anticipate in as much as we can. Um, so there's a, those are, I think, my three examples. And, and again, there are so many more of them. And, and um, yeah. Yeah, those are great. And I think they're, they're examples that we, all parents can relate to in some, in some way, right? Whether I have young kids, I have a three and a half year old and a six year old. So I look at these and I'm like, you know, I'm not at the high school plans yet, but I am at the, how can we be, be proactive in their needs? And then also like, yeah, my kids get disappointed even as a three and a half year old, six year old, right? Like the things that in their mind should be able to happen and right now in our environment aren't able to happen. And so being able to really have those conversations and, and set them up to be able to work through their disappointment and their emotions, which is hard when you're six years old, right? And it's hard when you're three and a half. So um, I, I really appreciate that because I think this applies for all ages and all different levels of needs. So I think that's great examples. It, well, I want to say too, Adriana, is that it, it really helps with uh, it really helps with them being able to problem solve for themselves also by working through it, even if you're working through it with them, uh, by saying that it's a struggle for you and exampling, well, no, I don't know what I'm doing, but we can get through this together, right? And and having that courage to move forward. Um, one of the things too that I'm sorry I didn't say earlier, Aaron, is when you had mentioned going back to school and friends. Uh, I didn't use this example because I think I didn't think about it until then, but uh, one of the concerns or one of the things that I remember talking through with my daughter is that uh, it's okay for our friends to change. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we have shared interests mm -hmm. and so we like to do that. It doesn't mean that we don't care for the other person. We just aren't doing the same things anymore. And uh, as, as children grow, and I think about this, uh, when we go back to school, the people that we were close to once, we might not be anymore. Maybe we picked up a new hobby that doesn't interest our friends, or maybe they did, and that's not what we're into. Um, so having, having those conversation is really gonna be helpful that it might look different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a great one to, to consider in our current situation, for sure. And, and kind of leading us into that, this next um, part of our presentation. So one part that we, we've really um, made sure that we included a student voice, because as adults, you know, our lens that we look through um, is important, but it also is important to make sure we're looking through the student lens as well. So um, Erin was able to connect with one of our Thunder Mountain students, um, Shemarie Marte, and she's um, working with um, NAMI through our Sources of Strength program here in the district, which is great. So she's one of our student um, kind of representatives within that organization. Um, and so Erin, can you talk a little bit about what, sh what Shemarie shared with us and um, her thoughts in terms of how we can work through this anticipation of needs? Yeah. So. We talked and filled up pages and pages of notes and I tried to pare it down to just what we have here. But we talked about physical needs, transportation was the biggest one that kept coming up. And also just um, reminders related to time and scheduling things came up a few times about being helpful. And one that I never would have considered is sharing an activity. Like, like hey, let's all start drinking more water to be more healthy or let's all start going to sleep a little bit earlier. So I don't know if that really counts as a physical need or not, but like joining in to do the activity to promote some kind of behavior change or new healthy habit, um, Chemory thought was really helpful, which mm -hmm. I love that idea and never would have thought of that. So great that their family is already doing that stuff. 
Um, then we talked about emotional support and emotional needs and, and how Shemri would like her parents to um, anticipate emotional needs. And uh, again, trying to boil it down and really offering space and time when needed and to collaborate when needed and trying to feel out like, when are we problem solving? When are we just listening? When are we taking time to cool off? And having some kind of shared understanding of what stage of that process we're all at in any given time seemed like the biggest, most important piece. Um, the third one here, how does she ask her parents to support advancement activity? She likes reminders and um, she likes advice, particularly for a new thing. And this comes up a lot in a lot of different ways in our conversations with young people, but while they don't always want advice, sometimes they just want to be heard. Um, they do like a rundown of a new thing. So if it's a new sport that they haven't played before, like what goes into that new sport so that they don't show up blind on the first day of it. And if they're going to a new school, what's that new school like so that they're not walking in blind on day one. So when it's something where they don't have the experience and their parents do, or their parents know how to find somebody who has that experience, like getting a tour of a building, your parents don't need to have been in Thunder Mountain before, as long as you know who'd ask for a tour of Thunder Mountain. But like that help with new stuff is really valued. And then the last one is, how did she want her parents to ask her before, before an event? Like, hey, how can we support you? And she thought that just having time set aside to talk regularly was the best way. Um, so they always have dinner together and that way things come up. So it's part of the natural conversation that next Friday she has a activity going on and they'll talk about how does she feel about it? Is she prepared? What will she need beforehand and all that stuff. So having a set time to talk makes the needs come up naturally as opposed to figuring out how to wedge it in in the middle of your day. So awesome feedback from her. Absolutely. And what I love about this and the other parts of our series, like all this has started to build, right? So when we look at the student input and looking through their lens, like we're seeing a pattern of some of the things that our, our, our kids really want and they really need. Um, and I just, the thing that keeps resonating is like just building time to be together and, and just listen and then finding out if they want the feedback, right? And sometimes just listening is enough and sometimes they truly do need your, <laughs> need your input. So, um, and it's come from like all of our presenters with our students. So I, I really, I like that. And they're all from different walks of life with different experiences and they're all kind of coming back to the same thing. So um, that's, that's good. It's giving us a really good sight, right? What we're getting to see. So. I, I really like that part too about um, sharing the activity together, doing it together, right? And that's something that is so critical. Let's let's do this together, and um, you know, we we might all love it together, or we might all not like it together, but we are sharing an experience, right? Uh, and then the other thing uh, that I. I think is so brilliant is the new experience and what we could have done and how we could have supported him. Um, in hindsight, as a parent, and again, we have to have grace, it would have been really, really wonderful if we took our son to a tournament beforehand so that he could see this building and see how it goes. That would have been uh, really supportive. And again, you know, we're, we're not gonna be able to anticipate it all, but we can listen and we can learn. And, and listen to the kids, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. All right, so this is a, I love this one. We, talk, we spent some time talking about this before we, we did our recording. Um, so Aaron, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what do you mean by credibility matters and how could that impact conversations at home? So you said that like, the feedback from students is building up. And so this is based on Shemery's feedback and Tasha's feedback and all the, everything that we've heard from students so far that credibility matters. So happy to hear from a parent when the parent has experienced something they haven't, but if it's something that the, that the parent doesn't know about, like social media, like parents just have no hope of keeping up on social media the way that their kids do. Like that's just, just the way it is. And so just listening in those moments as opposed to coming from a place of authority because you don't have credibility because you haven't used, you haven't spent 300 hours on TikTok the way your kids have. So 
that credibility and what you're talking about, super important. I think we made this graphic a little bit more intense than it needed to be, but hopefully the, the point is made. Absolutely, yes, I, I agree. And it's okay to not know the information and just listen. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember because as adults, we often want to always give some sort of feedback, but we don't always have to. Great, so the next um, kind of component of our presentation is um, our checklist. So, you know, some steps that we can take um, to kind of work towards this process of being able to anticipate the needs. And so, um, Aaron, would you mind describing kind of this checklist and the process and some of the things that we put on it? Yeah, so just for any upcoming thing, it could be something fun that Uncle Tony's coming to visit, could be something neutral, like you have two days off next week. I guess that's not neutral, that's fun too. Um, but you know, just anything that's coming up in the future and like just talking about it, bring it up and ask what kind of support they'll need. Okay, we've got two days off next week or you need a ride somewhere, should we coordinate a ride for you? If, if I, the parent, I'm gonna be at work um, and being an active listener while asking what kind of support they'll need. And then how would they like to receive that support? And I think that's the kind of the ambiguous, tricky one, but um, uh, maybe it's, well, like if we go back to the example of relationships, hey, it'll be tough if you break up with your person that you're in a relationship with, and you said that you want somebody to talk to. Do you want to talk to me, your parent? Would you rather talk to your friends about it? Um, and when would you want that to happen? Right away, maybe a couple, after a couple of days of cooling off, how do you want that support after that future event happens? talking it through and finding the right fit to make sure that needs are met, anticipating needs. That's the whole thing. Great, yeah, thank you. And I think it's nice to have just some steps to be able to go off of, but again, like you might only get to step one, right? And that's a starting point. And then as you get more comfortable with the process then you start adding some of these additional steps. So I think that's a great um, thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that uh, big three letter word ASK ask is is huge. It's just it's huge, and and I uh, would love to tell you that's that's how I did, but I I think I mostly told right because I because I had all the answers until I didn't. Um, so I I appreciate that, and I I want to say in working with Aaron, I see that in play, and it's like it it's it makes you pause, it makes you think right, mm -hmm. and and be a part of that conversation. And again, expressing great care and respect. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Um, well, to kind of wrap up our uh, discussion today, just wanted to share, um, we've shared all these resources before, but just I think they're really important um, local resources that we wanna make sure families have access to or maybe they didn't know about. So um, lots of great ones associated with um, the school system and then ones associated with our community. So um, you can always come back to these resources and we have some, some um, ones specifically for students to get involved with different things within our community. And then we also have some great resources um, for guardians and parents. So if you're interested in, in learning some more skill sets or just you know having some people to talk to to learn some more information, there's some great resources out there for um, within our community as well. And so then, there was... Uh, sorry, Adriana, there was one uh, resource that's a teen support group that I think is new I, that I just wanted to highlight um, from what we had in our first. Um, so on the bottom there, the teen uh, uh, Juno support group, it's a uh, it's a uh, peer led as well as having a, a, a clinician um, on board as well it happens Thursday seven to eight on zoom. Um, and uh, contact Stephanie at AWARE for more information. But this one is community supported. The Teen Health Center is involved. Um, certainly uh, NAMI and Juno Suicide Prevention is involved. Um, AWARE is involved, the uh, Teen Center. So it's, it's really uh, a great resource. Um, and the whole premise of the, of the group is just a safe place for um, teens to come and be empowered and find a safe place to support whatever is going on in your world. You, you can open it up. You can be, I'm just lonely and want to hang out. You can be, my parents are really aggravating me, you know, or whatever. 
Great. Yeah. And I, I love, we just have so many amazing resources in our community. I just, I, I appreciate um, this list and I know that there's many more out there too that we don't even have listed. So that's, that's great. Um, and then finally, our Alaska Care Line, we just like to um, kind of wrap up our presentation to, with a really important resource that's right at your fingertips. Um, so the Alaska Care Line app is available to download on our phones. It's a terrific resource to have on hand for ourselves or our loved ones. And like any other plan, it's good to have resources in place before the need arises. Um, Tina, do you wanna add anything to, to inform families about this resource? I, I think I just really want to say that it can be downloaded and uh, recognizing that um, it's not just a resource for yourself, it's also a resource for your loved ones or maybe even a stranger. Uh, but having it, having it in my purse doesn't always work. Having it on my phone, I almost always know where that is and how to get to it. it, it going through my phone is a lot easier than going through my purse. Um, so downloading it is, is really terrific. Um, the care line, you can talk with an individual right then, any hour. And if you're wanting more support or something else in the community, they can help to direct you to that as well. Um, so also, if you download it on the phone, you can kind of play around in the app and see what's there. Great. Yeah, so if you haven't had a chance to take a look, definitely get this app downloaded and, and have it there. And maybe you'll never need it and that's, that's okay too. But if you do, it's right there at your fingertips. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Erin, Tina, as always, I love working with you guys and I've, I learned so much as a parent. I learned so much as an educator that I can literally, you know, when students are back in the building next week for me, it's like if there's things that I can already start automatically working with students on and even with my staff, right? Um, this is a, a challenging time for not only our, our youth, but the adults. And so I think these are all things that we can apply in our lives in all different capacities. So I always, I always learn a ton. So thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to do thank it. You. All thank right. you. Well, thank you. And thank you, Juno families. Um, feel free to let us know once these are posted, if you have any feedback or any thoughts, as always, feel free to, to send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.